So how do we think that area affects species richness? We think that the larger the area is, the more likely you will find geographic barriers inside this large area. And the more geographic barriers you have, the more speciation you tend to, uh, to expect given enough time. Also, the more area there is, most likely you will find more resources. And the more resources there are, the larger the populations become. Well, at least conceptually. And this last link, uh, the larger the populations are, the less extinctions you expect. So that's how area may affect species richness. Or that's, that's one of the reasons why we should expect that larger areas will be species richer. Uh, as for temperature, the larger the, uh, uh, the higher the temperature is, the more likely you will find species uh, mutating. Uh, well, the larger the temperature, higher the energy in your cells, and uh, generation times are usually shorter, and also the incidence of solar radiation may promote mutation, and of course, uh, genetic variation is the engine of every speciation event. So, uh, the higher the temperature, the higher the mutation rates. And also, the larger the temperature, the shorter the generation time for, for species. And combined, these two processes will boost diversification rates, will increase diversification rates. And of course, the larger the diver diversification rates, the more species you expect. As for energy and productivity, uh, the energetic hypothesis says that the larger the temperature in a given place, the, more the larger the populations will be. Uh, it's a still an, an, a link that needs to be studied. Uh, it's not so, uh, this, this pattern or it's not unde undebatable. And also, the larger the populations, the larger the number of species you expect. And that's even more debatable. Uh, there, has, there have been a couple hypotheses to explain this link, but it still needs a lot of work. The productivity hypothesis says that the larger the temperature, the higher the temperature, and the more humidity there is in a given place, more productivity we will have. Like the plants will uh, do more photosynthesis, and we'll, there will be more food for herbivores, and more food, for, more food for carnivores, larger the populations will be, and the larger the productivity, the larger the populations. And if everything goes as we expect, the larger the populations, the more species we'll, we will have. And still, this is a missing link in this uh, causal chain. We don't really understand uh, why larger populations should promote speciation. And it's still a, a link that needs more empirical studies. Well, there is very strong evidence, at least empirical evidence, that productivity is correlated with species richness. Uh, actual evapotranspiration, or AET, uh, is strongly co correlated with species richness of birds. 
So every point in this chart is a site. And for each particular site, we have the number of species of birds that lives in that particular place. So for example, here, 500. And then we have the amount of evapotranspiration in that particular place. And as you see, there is a very clear trend of increasing species richness as you increase uh, uh, evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is a, potentially a measure of uh, primary productivity. Um, and the colors here for the, for the dots uh, are different regions in the planet. Nearctic, Neotropic, Palearctic, uh, Afrotropic, and Australia. So this is a general, there is a general trend in, in the planet that when you increase primary productivity, you increase species richness, at least for birds. Okay, are we okay so far? So I have shown you what are the patterns we're gonna study, <coughs> what are the potential causes for these patterns. So I hope I have created a background, a theoretical and conceptual background for what our goal is to understand the causes of biodiversity, okay? Uh, what we will talk now is um, how scientists, how researchers have studied these patterns, have described, have measured, and how we can use some tools, especially statistical tools, to study these patterns, to find the answers to these questions, okay? And we cannot talk about geographical ecology without mentioning uh, Robert MacArthur, uh, who is one of the guys that have uh, worked on this, on that island uh, pattern that I've shown you which I hope you're gonna remember the name of his theory by the end of the day. Um, and um, MacArthur has set probably the entire scene for working in uh, spatial patterns in species richness, what are their causes, uh, what, how we should study it, and for uh, it's, it's still a book I recommend everybody to read. Uh, it's, it's atemporal. At, atemporal? It doesn't have a particular time or it's not outdated. It's a very special book, has lots of ideas inside. Um, so after MacArthur, uh, the next uh, very influential book is Spatial Ecology by Tillman and uh, Peter Kareva. Is that how you pronounce? Uh, but it's much more on the population side. And it doesn't really affect or study how species richness or how biotas emerge. And after this, we can also mention uh, a relatively recent book on the uh, neutral, neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography. And there, uh, Hubble starts to discuss, or at least sets a couple of methods on what should be the expectation for species richness if the environment doesn't uh, affect species richness and if uh, species are all similar. Why is this exercise interesting? Because if we can isolate the effect of the difference between species, then we can understand how the different components of biodiversity or, or how these different drivers affect or drive these patterns. So ideally, I would like to have a map that says how much of the environment 
drives this pattern? And how much is just the particular biology of those species? And how much is historical? And how much is regional? So ideally, I would like to isolate these this possible causes and, and understand uh, how did this, this entire map of concepts, uh, how strong these links are. And if we come up with ways to isolate these links, then we can understand a lot easier how these patterns emerge. And a couple years earlier, um, Jim Brown um, coined the term ma macroecology. And macroecology is not something that Jim Brown started. Uh, but he did formalize and um, with an author, with a co-author, has uh, coined the name. And according to him, macroecology is a non-experimental statistical investigation of the relationship between the dynamics and interaction of species populations that have been studied in small scales. And here I would like to highlight the non-experimental and the statistical investigation. So when someone says that it's doing macroecology, you usually do not expect that person to be doing field work, or at least not for that particular study. Of course, people that do field work also do macroecology, or vice versa. But one macroecological study is never a result of a single field expedition. You usually need to collect data over decades so that you can actually look at these patterns from a broader perspective. So it's a study of these populations that have been studied in small scales by ecologists. And the process of speciation, extinction, and expansion and range contraction that have been investigated in a much larger scale by biogeographers, paleontologists, and macroevolutionists. So macroecology is the meeting place between ecology and biogeography, right? And of course it takes uh, decades to compile data sets and the data sets we're going to use today is the result of the work of probably hundreds of people in the field. So we usually need uh, uh, large data sets to, work, to do any macroecological study. So these, these patterns that we're going to study today, they have been studied in small scales by ecologists. And they also have been studied in much larger scales by biogeographers. But why is macroecology interesting? Because we can try to have this uh, dual perspective on the same pattern, to think of the small scales, the interaction between species, the stochastic extinction, but also the regional perspective of biotic interchange, speciation events, adaptive radiation, extinction events, all meeting at the same place. Okay, so now on the methodolo methodological side, he, we have patterns, we have spatial patterns, and it can be the map of species richness of a group. It can be also a map of abundance. It can be a map of evenness, phylogenetic community structure. It can be any pattern, any spatial pattern you want or you have. And now we're going to study and how to describe this pattern, how to measure it, how to uh, get insights from looking at these maps. 
what are the potential causes for this? Well, population processes, something like birth and death rates for the population. Of course, it may generate a spatial pattern. Uh, dispersion, migration. So, also spatial events or geographical events for that particular species or population. Uh, also, evolutionary and phylogenetic events like speciation. It also happens on geographical space. Historical events, continental drift, the uh, emergence of a river, it also affects biotas. Environmental factors like area, topography, temperature, humidity. Let's see if I have another one. Species interactions. So how one species relates to another. Can two species coexist in a single place? Right. So we have this, this set of uh, event or factors. And now I'm going to group them into two groups. The factors that are particular to species, for example, population processes, or uh, population rates, like birth and death rates, these are particular to the species. We can imagine a scenario, a very simplified scenario, where environment is flat, like similar, homogeneous, and still the species will have a birth and death rate. Because this is a property that belongs to the species. Migration and dispersion also belongs to the species. A species can fly and will migrate a given number of kilometers, even if the environment is flat, it's homogeneous. So these are, for example, uh, two factors that's, that actually uh, is describe the, spe the species in itself. It's, it's a characteristic of the species. But evolutionary and historical events are not only particular to the species. It depends not only on the biology, but also somewhat in the uh, place and characteristics of the environment where the species is. And finally, of course, environmental factors and species interaction have the potential to affect the distribution, the abundance of species. And we can think that uh, how the species will react to this environmental factor is not only char a, a characteristic of the biology of the species, right? So. I'm going to group this set of factors into something we call, we're going to call endogenous or intrinsic factors that affect abundance and species richness, or these are the intrinsic causes of the distribution and abundance of species. And this environmental factor in species interaction, we can call the exogenous.